So we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts this morning, chapters 19 and 20. I'm going to cover a big section. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to find a text, our main comments are going to be from Acts 20, verses 18 through 38. So if you want to get yourself there, that's what we'll mainly cover. <clears throat> Acts 19 is fairly lengthy, contains a lot of information, and I'm not going to I'm going to keep a focus on kind of the direction that we've had throughout the book of Acts. So I'm I'm going to kind of really race through chapter 19. So I'm going to start out by reading chapter 19 verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> While Apollos was at Corinth, and you'll remember our last study in Acts, we talked about Apollos. So here he is in Corinth, he's mentioned, and Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Remember, those who don't remember, Paul had left Ephesus to go to Syria, and it was during that point that Apollo shows up at Corinth, and so now Luke is continuing that story. While he was in Ephesus, Paul found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <clears throat> So Paul says, well, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they said. So <clears throat> it's very similar to, to the introduction we had to Apollos in Acts 18. And the reason I wanted to just mention this, it shows us the diversity that was already occurring in the early church. We tend to think that the early church was one big, harmonious, homogenous, happy family. And our study in Acts have revealed, has revealed that that's not true. Well, meeting Apollos and now meeting these guys in Ephesus who had not even heard of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of, other than the baptism of John, shows you that somehow the gospel is traveling concentrically away from Jerusalem at a rate that the disciples can't keep up with. Because these guys apparently had not come to Christ under Peter's influence, James's influence, or Paul's influence, because all three of those, and, and even you remember when the Holy Spirit fell and then the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> persecution happened in Jerusalem and the Hellenistic Jews who had become Christians fanned out Philip and Stephen, well, Stephen was executed. Mainly Philip were given the story of, but these guys go out preaching the gospel, but they would have they preached the Holy Spirit because they were there in Acts chapter 2. So we don't know how these guys are coming to Christ without hearing of the Holy Spirit, but that's the account we get from Luke. So Paul shares with them and lays hands on them, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, similar to Acts chapter 2. Now to read Acts 19, 8 through 10. Paul entered the synagogue, this is in Ephesus, and spoke there boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, and had... Uh, discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyr Tyr Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia <coughs> heard the word of the Lord. So basically we know Paul had his ministry and established the church between two and three years in the city of Ephesus, which was a huge, uh, in that day, it was a huge city in the Roman world and a quite strategic place. Now, Luke records miracles in Acts chapter 19 through the Apostle Paul. We have seen that prior to this, Luke doesn't record a whole lot of miracles from Paul. Not saying he didn't have miracles, but Luke didn't choose to record them probably because that wasn't the most obvious thing that had happened in the cities. Those of you who've been in our study remember that the most obvious thing that Luke records is Paul gets persecuted by Jews and Jewish Christians everywhere he goes. But in Acts 19 in Ephesus, we get miracle stories, two or three. <clears throat> and we also know from our study that Paul never talks about miracles, about what he did in the miraculous. So it's interesting that in Ephesus, that's what we get. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20 begins and Paul feels the need to go to Jerusalem again. Five times Luke tells us Paul went to Jerusalem. Interesting tidbit that I don't want to get into, but in the letters of Paul, Paul only references three trips to Jerusalem while Luke records five. It's a very interesting dynamic there that we're not going to talk about, but just 
give you a little tidbit of knowledge there. <clears throat> Paul wants to get to, to Jerusalem before Pentecost. He's in a hurry. And because he's in a hurry, on his route, he does what Paul tends to do. He goes and visits the churches that he had established to strengthen them, to make sure they're okay, to, to check on them. And then because he doesn't want to get held up in Ephesus, he calls and asks the elders, the leaders he had left in charge in Ephesus, to meet him at a port city where he's going to board a boat to go to Jerusalem. He just doesn't want to get held up in Ephesus. And that's what we're going to focus on, Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> that's really ridiculous. I failed to set my timer. But I'm doing well and I'm not going to worry about it. But I'll, I'll come under the gun, I know. <clears throat> Paul's about to let the leaders in Ephesus know in Acts 20 that they will probably never see him again. Paul believes he's headed towards his death and that it's imminent. He wants the leaders in Ephesus, he wants to leave them with some really important pastoral guidelines and exhortation because he doesn't think he's ever going to be there again. Let's pray and then we're going to look at our main text, Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 38. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the time to worship you. We ask you to open our minds and open our hearts and speak to us through your scripture here <clears throat> as we listen to what Paul is leaving the leaders in this pretty new church in Ephesus. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to read and I'm going to skip over some of the things. It's a fairly long discourse. I'm going to skip over some of the parenthetical comments that Luke records that Paul had said and try to, again, stick to the main focus of what we're looking at. <clears throat> so Paul opens up. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Now, obviously, that, rem that reminds us to what we've been studying, that Paul gets persecuted everywhere he goes. But this thing, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing. Does that remind anybody of a text that we've studied recently? Anybody? 1 Corinthians, I came to you in fear and trembling. <clears throat> Yet, Paul says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but in fact I've taught publicly and house to house. So the point of what Paul's saying is, look, I've been dogged by my Jewish rivals. I've been dogged by Jewish Christians who don't like my message to the Gentiles. But in the midst of that persecution, I have not hesitated to speak what you needed to hear and to speak the truth. <clears throat> and then look what he says. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship is facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Now, I just announced earlier <clears throat> that we're going to be studying 2 Timothy. A little preview. That's Paul, towards the end of his life, writing a letter to Timothy, who is the pastor elder over the church in Ephesus. So here Paul is speaking to the leaders of Ephesus before he is going to Jerusalem where he thinks he's going to die. And I'm telling you, as I read this text and studied it, 2 Timothy keeps coming to my mind. There are a lot of things that Paul says <clears throat> in this discourse that are echoed in his letter to, the, to Timothy called 2 Timothy. <clears throat> I'm going to continue. Now I know that none of you will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock 
which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of. Be shepherds of God's church. <clears throat> I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw people away to follow them. Does that remind anybody of anything we've studied in our study in Acts? Anybody? Does it remind you of anything? Okay, well, remember in, in Corinth, there are people who are pitting Paul against Apollos. And there's apparently, if you read First and Second Corinthians, there are a group of people who basically said, eh, we're not big fans of Paul anymore. And Paul perceives that as people attacking his apostolic leadership and drawing saints, church, church people away from his influence. So I think Paul might be referencing that right here. That men from your own number will rise up to draw men away to themselves, to create a, another following, to create a, another denomination, if you will. The early church had these divisions. I don't know how many of you have ever heard people say, oh, we need to be like the early church. They didn't have denominations. They didn't call it denominations, but they had followings just like we do. <clears throat> so be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you about these things with tears night and day. The whole message reminds me of 2 Timothy. And then finally, now I commit you to God and the word of his grace. And then he goes back to another Pauline comment that he makes over and over and over in his letters. You yourselves know how I lived among you. And he says, you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak among us. That's real interesting to me. Here we have Paul laying down a framework that as we earn wages, part of why we earn wages is to look out for those misfortunate around us. <clears throat> and then Paul says, remembering the words of Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. <clears throat> That's an interesting comment that Luke gives us that Paul makes, referring to a saying of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you search your Gospels, you will not find that phrase in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The only place we have it is in the book of Acts. Paul referring to a saying of Jesus. It's very interesting. But you might remember that when Paul was with the guys in Jerusalem, they laid down parameters for him and he said the last thing was to remember the poor, which I already had in my mind to do. So this is a, it just marks, again, a very important thing for the Apostle Paul. Now my phone is turned on me. It won't turn on. And then to finish, when Paul finished the message, when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept and embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. Paul boards the ship and moves on. What can we learn from this? It's a text that is not readily, you know, it doesn't lend itself really quickly to a, quote, spiritual lesson. But I'm believing that things have come into your hearts and minds. I have a few things I can mention. <clears throat> but I'm going to pray and then we're going we're to open it up for sharing. Lord, again, as we've asked you week after week, we've, we've asked you to open our hearts, we've asked you to open our minds, to speak to us through your word. And I'm asking you to speak through your people what you are saying to, to them and to us in Jesus' name.